welcome friends to this third and final day of our celebration of the bandara of great master hazur maharaj baba sawan singh ji the master who initiated me in 1936 and whose in whose remembrance we we did this three day affair here yesterday was a great day and i am sure that you all experienced extraordinary love and flow of grace just to be sure i'd like to ask you how many of you actually felt yesterday was a special day that was extraordinary with your love and flow of grace i'm very happy to see this response the bandara was successful and even if you had not raised your hands bandara would still be successful <laughs> when i was in a state of intoxication and when i am in intoxicated i can do things which i don't know whether i should be doing or not <laughs> so if i did something which you didn't like please forgive me for that <laughs> this is just a way of uh, using a particular day to remember the master remember our priority in life it does not mean that we should only do it once a day once a year every day should be a day of bandara every day should be a day of being intoxicated in the love of your master this is a path of love only a path of love if i talk of the path to a true home it's only a path of love and if it is just a realization of different levels of consciousness of discoveries of different possibilities in human consciousness then of course it's also a mental game and the mind loves to see these things it's curious they are curious by nature and therefore we love to see new things and we do have an opportunity to see lot of new things when we use this process of meditation of going within and discovering that our own consciousness can generate so many experiences when somebody asks me is it my imagination or is it real with tongue in cheek i said no this is real this is not imagination but today i want to tell you the truth there is no difference what's right to the two it's difficult to believe it we have defined reality in a different way it's all imagination the whole creation is imagination but we have a definition of reality that if we cannot see how we are imagining if we cannot see any other way of checking reality except by an experience we are having and experience is generating objects and subjects which are creating that experience and the only way to check is against one sense perception and another we define reality as that if you really examine we do the same thing when we are sleeping and dreaming in the dream you say is it a dream or not you say no i can see i can see i can touch i can smell and i can ask other people is it real dream or are we real they all say we are real and you wake up none was real it's all imaginary this world that all worlds are created the same way a dream was a conscious phenomenon created by consciousness this is also being created by consciousness this ability to find the truth about this is what is possible through a practice of meditation a practice of going within and more within more within ultimately to your core this is possible if you discover what is the core what is the core from where all this is happening it's your own conscious self from where it is happening so when we see a reality outside and we say it's real because it looks real it behaves real it is created as real we take it as real these both the definitions we have reality is completely relative relative to the state or level of awakening we have we are awakened to the physical wakefulness today and dream is not real for us we go to dream state that is real we have also some of us many of us have had experience where we had a dream within a dream in the second dream we wake up into the first dream say oh, that was not real and the second is real 
when we wake up to the physical reality, both are unreal. When we awaken to the next higher level of total wakefulness of the astral plane, this is just no more than a dream. If we keep awakening up like that, what happens at the end? We find there was only one consciousness. We discover ourselves. And by the way, I am not saying that it is exclusive privilege of a particular class or a group or a system or a religion or a, a, a system of belief that can do it. Anybody can do it. Whether you believe it or not, you can do it. It's a question of experimenting. It's a total experiment. It's a total scientific experiment. The only thing is don't go in an outside lab to do the experiment. Go to the inside lab. But the experiment is purely scientific. And you withdraw your attention scientifically by scientific principles. And you go become unaware, which is possible. We have seen it all the time. You put your attention on one thing, you become unaware of other things. This capability we have of controlling what we are aware of is the secret of all creation. That we become aware of something that becomes created, that becomes our experience. The grandest illusion we have is that when we have an experience of something, we do not think the experience is real. We think that things that are creating that experience are real. That's a grand illusion. It's, whether it's a dream or wakefulness or higher levels of awareness, in every stage it's the same thing. Every stage is the same thing that we create an experience, no matter how small or how big, and we ascribe that experience to the objects that occur in that experience. It, it could be objects that are alive or objects that are not alive. We share our own life with the objects that are alive. People say if there is one consciousness, how come it was divided among so many? How come we are all, are, who is dreaming out, out of us? We are hundreds of people sitting here. Who is dreaming? Are we all dreaming? Are we all collectively dreaming? Supposing you go into a sleep state and have a dream and there are 100, 200 people sitting there and we ask this question, who is dreaming? Who out of all those is dreaming? Do you know the answer to it? Wherever the self is felt, wherever a character in the dream experiences the self and watches others, that alone wakes up and is the dreamer. Is it true at all levels of creation? If you wake up to the next state, the one who wakes up will discover that all others were part of the dream. And only one was the dream. This can go right up to the top where you discover the totality of consciousness as the only dreamer. The ultimate dreamer is dreaming, dream within dream within dream. And we are in a state of multiple dreams and have come down here and looks real. Every dream is made real. There is a great grand purpose in this. The grand purpose is that how do we appreciate our state of oneness, our state of being in a state of bliss with nothing around, a state of non-creative oneness. How do we appreciate that? We appreciate with creation. Because if the true nature of our own true self, ultimate self, is consciousness that bears within itself total knowledge, total awareness, total love, total bliss, if that's the definition of our totality, that how do we appreciate all these things? How do we know they are there? How does consciousness become conscious of its own self? Process of creation. Process of creating realities. And that's what's going on. Now this is, I am not suggesting to you some theoretical model that has been set up to explain creation. I am suggesting something to you that people have experimented with it. And they have found the same results. They have not found different results. They found the same results. That when you are able to withdraw your attention to yourself. And no other co goal. No other point to be fixed. There is no place to go to. The true meditation requires you to pull yourself to your own self. The self that is not the cover upon the self. 
a cell that is not covered by a reality created by the self. Pull yourself from that to the core of your own self. You will find this is not your form. Like in the dream, that was not your form. You woke up in a sleeping form that woke up. You go to higher state, you sleep, you wake up from another sleeping state with a different form. And you keep on waking up. Eventually, you are the one who through these sequences of dreams, through these creations, is so much better able to appreciate the power, beauty, joy, bliss of being that one. That's the grand purpose of the entire creation. And yet, if we say, why did we create pain and suffering? Why did we create so much misery and terror? At least in the physical world, we see so much terror. In dream world, we see nightmares. Why did we create so much negative experiences? The answer is simple. That all conscious experiences we have are in pairs of opposites. That if we don't have one, the other appears, it disappears actually. Supposing we have light and darkness. Let's imagine there was in this physical plane no darkness. Just for the point of making an argument, let's say there was always light. A certain amount of light, no matter whether you close your eyes, open your eyes, put on light, not put on light, there was always light around. There was no darkness. Nobody would ever, ever have seen that light. No way you can see that light. There are so many things around here of which there is no opposite. We can't see them. We can't experience them. The very nature of this conscious ability that we have works in pairs of opposites. Therefore, these experiences that we are having in different levels create opposites. And yet, in our own oneness, in our own totality, there is no opposite. So how do we create an opposite where there is no opposite at all? We create through this great power of consciousness to create a reality which is an opposite. A, a reality of duality. A reality of pairs of opposites. The entire creation of the physical world and world below that and the world above that, the astral world of sensory perceptions, the causal world of the mental perceptions, these are all created as pairs of opposites. All of them, right up to the top of the mind, we can't think of anything except in opposites. And above that, there are no opposites. So to create a world of opposites, we were able to achieve an opposite of the world of no opposites and experience that also. It's very, even in terms of rationality, it makes sense that if there was no opposite, how could consciousness experience itself? It's experienced by creating an opposite of that, which is a world of opposites. It's, it's so perfectly matched. If you examine the whole creation in its totality, it's perfect. You will not be able to find. If you were given a task, see the whole of this creation and tell us where we can improve it, you can spend all your time and come back and say, there's nothing I can do. It's so perfect. If you see part of it, any part of it, it's imperfect. When you look at a part, it is imperfect. When you look at the whole, it's perfect. I gave example of the picture of my master, great master. I said, it looks perfect when I see it. Beautiful picture. Suddenly, I just see one and it makes sense to me. I cut it into pieces and put all the pieces into this on this table. And I can go on seeing them over and over again, thousand times, I'll never see the picture. Same thing is true about this creation. When we see part of the creation, we cut it up into small pieces. We cut this creation with our current observation into here and there, now and then, time and space. That's cutting it. That was scissors that are cutting up. We can't have a total view. But there is a point within us in consciousness where we can have a total view. And that's where you understand the whole game of creation. I hope that these three days we spend together will be useful in your pursuit of the ultimate truth. And I believe the ultimate truth, which will explain all other truth, truths even, is the realization of your own identity as that totality of consciousness, as that oneness. And all things will happen from there. This is within your reach as human beings. This is within your reach when you have the power of free will and experience of free will that enables you to seek. And when you seek, you find. 
no matter what you seek you seek anything and you keep on seeking you'll find if you give up you won't find but if you keep on seeking you'll find no matter what that's the nature of our ability to see is a very powerful ability and therefore you will use your power to seek and whatever you will seek it you will get i hope our association for these three days was useful to you i'll be very happy to uh, finish this gurdwara celebration now by offering you prashad prashad is blessed food blessed food means that when i give it to you i invoke the blessings of my master and i associate it with my memory of my master you take it you associate with the memory of your master and what happens after that when you eat it it little slow at a time so is that the advantage of getting prashad last longer when you eat it you remember the master it does not mean prashad changes in molecular structure or become something else this blessing does not change the material substance that is prashad is just something to eat probably a puff rice i suppose they give today whatever it is it is a association of ideas with how it was given who gave it what does it remind you of and that's the purpose of prashad why i'm saying this is because i know some of my friends they take prashad home somebody is sick i have got prashad as if it's a medicine for all cure in india they used to say there was a medicine called amrit dhara and they said prashad is like amrit dhara any sickness take that prashad of course you can take medicine and take a little prashad and say medicine is more effective because now you are remembering the grace of the man that's different but it is really the the utility of prashad is to be able to remember because our mind distracts us continuously in fact when we meet frequently we have monthly meetings nowadays in chicago area the whole idea is that our mind gets so absorbed in activities connected with the world which is our only reality that we forget the true purpose of life and this is to bring us back on track and as as we meet more often we remain on track and don't lose our priorities very often i get emails from people i am a human being i have you know all the obligations of life i have to take care of myself take care of my family i have to go to work and you know meditation of course i i would like to do but i don't have time for that i have so many other obligations well i said say to them you are a human being that's the good fortune to do something other than what you are doing if you are not a human being you wouldn't be able to do it the very fact you say you are a human being therefore you can't do something the reverse is true because you are a human being therefore you can do something other than what others can do so what else can you do you are a seeker you can see you are free will therefore seek and find and therefore as human being set a priority in your life i believe that we should lay down the highest priority to go back out to home or discover the truth because if we believe that we have been reincarnating over and over again that we have been trapped in this so called 8.4 billion species of life and go through all that over and over again we should at least stop that and cry of all we have we have had enough of course if somebody says i have not had enough my message is not for that person i want to make it clear if somebody says i am enjoying my life i am very happy why should i follow the spiritual path and why should i try to look for god or anybody else i said you don't need to have a good time enjoy i remember a friend of mine in the good old days in the 60s when i was studying here the good old friend of mine says to me i am very happy i have a lot of money i have got a nice place i have got everything that i need i have got a nice family and i am enjoying life why should i follow what you are telling i said no you don't have to follow in fact you should not follow if i were in your state i would not follow anything except enjoy it go ahead enjoy it like one week later he came back again to me he said you know my life is terrible <laughs> so horrible my wife left me you know so and so deserted me 
so and so cheated me. I am so mad at them. I said, what happened in one week? <laughs> he said, no, I was talking about external things. But it is true. We have an external life and an internal life. We have tangible life, which can be seen. Nice home, nice family, good people, good people, lot of money. It's all tangible. And then the intangibles. How happy are you in your relationships? How is your emotional health? How good are you in contentment and satisfaction with what you get? How disappointed are you in various things? These don't show up. They're intangibles. And I did an experiment when I was at Harvard University. In one of my papers, I prepared a paper on this comparison of tangible and intangible things. And I was surprised with a, with a sampling of 1,000 people living in the greater Boston area. I was able to find out that those who had more tangible things had less intangible happiness. Those who had more intangible happiness had less of those other things. If I put all that result together, I found whoever the creator is, he did a fairly good job. And he was fair to everybody. He gave some more tangible assets, some he gave more intangible assets. We don't see the internal part of a person. So we are all happy and unhappy in different ways. One of the questionnaires I put down to that thousand member questionnaires I put to that sampling was, what makes you happy? Give me 10 points that make you happy. Point number one, more money, more fame, good house, good this thing, or 10 points. Top was money. So after this survey, I interviewed those people. I went to one man who was a professor uh, earlier at Harvard University and then was in business. And we knew his assets were 10 million dollars or more. So I decided to have an interview since I was a Harvard scholar and he was a former professor. He gave me all the courtesy and answered my questions. I said, you have said in the answer to the survey that money makes one happy. Are you happy? He said, no. You said you are happy, and now you say no. Why not? He said, I went to school, I went to college, I spent eight years in this, and I did so much study, got a PhD, got a degree. And after all that, I built up a business, and I, my net worth is 10 million. Look at that bloke next door, never went to school, never went to college, his assets are 20 million. How can I be happy? <laughs> this man's happiness was depending upon his neighbor. Can you imagine this is many of us are in that state? That we are comparing ourselves with other people. In fact, one wise man was giving the audience advice. He said, if you want to be happy, look at people who have less than you. If you want to be unhappy, look at those who are more than you. He gave a simple formula. So the point is that we are all creating our realities and creating these comparisons and basing our happiness. Basing our true state of being, even our state of love and joy and bliss, we are basing upon these considerations which are all external and created like that. If you do meditation and go within, go stage by stage, what we have been discussing all these years, happiness will come from within. Happiness is all inside. The experience is within. And the experience of, of being able to realize who you are at every level adds to the happiness and bliss that you can't find outside at all. I'm not giving this as an inducement or incentive to go inside. I'm only saying that those who have experimented have said so. You try. But don't believe because somebody else says. Don't believe what I say. Don't believe unless you test it out. I have said repeatedly, on this path which I follow, given by this man. He insisted that there is no scope for blind faith in this path at all. Blind faith is religion. Blind faith are schools of discipline of who are disciplinarians. There's no love there. You see the strict disciplines and they are spiritual paths they are following and there's no love. How can there be a spiritual path? Then love is our own essence. Religion has reduced itself to rituals. 
It used to be something different. The founders didn't talk like that. But the current followers of religion are dividing each other. Spirituality unites people. I know in my gathering, even here, the people from so many religions, people from so many nations from around the world, people of all colors are sitting here. This is nothing. Our, our reality has nothing to do with these things. And yet, the religions have divided us. If you are a true spiritual person, you will unite. And if you are a religious person, you will divide. We have separated religion from spirituality to such an extent. Anyway, I give you all my good wishes for going back home. We had a nice white Christmas in April yesterday. <laughs> and that was wonderful. And people who had come from uh, Singapore and the, in the southern part of the world, Latin America, South America, they enjoyed seeing ice and snow. And they had not seen this white stuff before. So I am very happy for them. And I look forward to seeing you again. And I will be now helping uh, you with the prashad. I wish I could go to each one of you, but now I am finding, both because of my age, you know, I will be 90 this November, and also because of the health. If you don't mind coming to me and taking prashad, will it be all right for you? Yes. Now, how many of you would like to take prashad so you can have it in life? Oh. <laughs> All right, please. We'll do that. We'll do that right now. Are we ready, John? So thank you very much for coming, joining me, and I'll be continue, uh, continuing with my uh, continuing with interviews later. But I will also uh, be coming back to see you if you are still here about three o'clock for a little while to say final bye bye to you. Okay, thank you.